So hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us for another Sharks for Kids webinar. Um, we are still going, we've been doing these since uh, May I think or April um, and we've got lots more coming up so keep an eye on our website, we've got lots more guests coming next month. Um, just one that I can think of is Rachel Graham who will be giving us a talk in October um, who we'd had to move um, but um, also visit our website for any resources for students and teachers um, and share them with the, the kids in your life. Um, but for today, I'm really excited to be hosting Dave Ebert, um, who is a very renowned um, shark researcher. Um, most of you will have heard of him. Um, you'll have seen his name on your textbooks. Um, or you'll have seen him on Sharks, Shark Week. Um, he's devoted his life to study in the ocean's most elusive, dangerous, and yet fascinating predators. The reason we're all here for the shark. Um, his travels and explorations have led to the discovery of over 50 new shark species. Um, he's an author of 30 books, including the very popular Sharks of the World, which I think everyone I know in our field has a copy on their shelf um, and as I said he's a regular on Shark Week um, particularly with the Alien Shark series um, and most recently Extinct or Alive Land of the Lost Sharks. Um, Dave's stories are compelling and humorous and if you've ever seen him talk before um, you'll definitely agree with that. Um, and so he is going to tell us about some of his work today and I'll let him introduce himself a little bit further. Cool. Great. Thanks, Jenny. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I got to say, it's kind of a new thing for me here doing, doing a virtual meeting. This is like my first, uh, my first virtual meeting. And so if I seem technologically challenged, uh, please bear with me. Um, it's just something new. I'm, I'm actually have, I, and if I kind of look away a little bit, because I'm up there in my little secret hideaway cabin in the mountains where I'd like to do a lot of my writing, like for my Sharks of the World book. And so I'm looking outside at a lake and some woods and some of the deer showed up with the fawns, the neighbors brought the kids. So, uh, so I'm not being ignoring you. I'm just kind of looking at the, the, uh, my audience outside, which is a little herd of deer right now. So anyway, um, thanks for again. Thanks for coming. And um, sort of the first thing I wanted to do is like, we'll give a shameless plug for a couple of books that I've been doing that are coming out. One is on the sharks, rays, and chimeras of Europe and the Mediterranean, which is coming out in Europe in November by Princeton University Press, and it'll be out uh, in the North America in uh, in December. But the big one I'm looking forward to, and that's what is one I'm working on right now, is the sharks is the new edition of the Sharks of the World. And that will be out in about February of 2021. And so look for it. Uh, uh, look for it. It'll be uh, pushed around on social media and elsewhere. And Princeton University Press is, gonna, is the publisher, as Wild Nature Press is. And it'll probably be also be on Amazon and other places. So anyway, just want to get that plug in there. So for a lot of you, it's probably kind of hard to imagine what it was like to be an explorer just even 30 or 40 years ago, especially today, because nowadays you can just, you know, you carry a, a little computer, your phone, phone camera in your pocket, and you really, you're never out of contact, no matter where you go in the world these days, because almost everywhere you go, you may not have anything else, but you usually have your phone and a GPS and some way to get around. But back in the 1980s, when I'd be leaving on an expedition uh, to a country called Namibia, to a place called the Skeleton Coast, which is one of the most remote areas in the world, I'd load up my truck, I had a map and a compass, which some of you younger people may have no idea what those are, but that's what we used back in the day before cell phones, and we'd take off on a great adventure. And it was just really, and, and this is before like social isolating was kind of a fashionable thing, because it'd be myself, my, uh, my uh, co-grad student, Paul, and we'd just take off and we'd tell some friends and our advisor, like, we're gonna be gone for eight weeks, but if you don't hear from us in 10 weeks, you should probably come look for us which means it probably didn't end very well for us because you just didn't have the opportunity to to communicate with people you'd literally say well we'll be gone for eight weeks and if you can't you know if we're not back then you might come check us out check out and see where we are so oops sorry um so anyway part of the whole thing of being 
going off on these on these expeditions and doing these things is is was was part of like going going off to look for something different, doing something different rather than just looking at looking for like a typical shark like you have here. Like for oops, sorry, a little problem here. Um, so you'd have things like like for example like a white shark, you know, which is a shark that everyone's very familiar with because of the Jaws movie and everything. Now. You know, nowadays people think like, oh, you know, it's very recognizable. Back before the Jaws movie came out in the mid '70s, when I was in high school, people never thought that much about sharks. You know, there'd be an occasional attack or something, but nobody really paid that much of attention to it. Well, the, you know, after the movie came out, people got interested in sharks. And and the thing that doesn't get kind of gets lost today is that when 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 in the 1980s, like for example, when I started out people started were interested to know more about sharks. And I was fortunate to catch that sort of first wave of young grad students to start, to start studying sharks. And I remember going to South Africa in the late 1980s and down in some of these places around Cape Town, False Bay, it was very common to see things like white sharks, uh, you know, breach. And, and people around there knew, knew about it quite well. And you knew if you went out certain times, you could see that. Well, most of the world had no idea this took place. This was a behavior. So I actually, you would come back home and I'd tell some of my friends and my advisors like, God, you can't believe these big sharks actually just come breaching out of the water. And they're thinking like, yeah, okay, Dave, like how much do you have to drink or something? And you know, back, I didn't even drink that. So it was like, it was no, no, really the guys, these do these guys, these sharks breach out of the water. Well, it was in, well, well, it was interesting. A couple of years after I left South Africa, a fellow named Chris Fallows actually captured all this on, on, on film and became the world famous for showing these sharks how they could breach and became rich. And of course, I'm thinking like, well, you know, I kind of told you guys this a few years ago, but I didn't think to actually take some pictures of this because when you actually see it, it's actually a very quick event. Your eyes aren't quite sure exactly uh, what's taking place. So, but the th point is that the white shark is something most people recognize quite readily, as is this species here. This is a tiger shark. Now, most sharks are fairly specific in what they eat. And you know, they, they're not just sort of randomly eating stuff. They're very specific. The tiger shark's an exception. And that was one thing that the movie Jaws had right, was that these things are essentially a garbage can with fins and that they'll shove anything in their mouth they can, boots, license plates, and just assorted trash. And they do occasionally, like the white sharks, attack uh, surfers or bathers or people in the ocean. But they're not actually, they're not actually looking for people. It's just some kinds you have a very, incident, you know, unfortunate incident with these sharks, with these large toothy sharks. But these are the types of sharks that most people think about, including this particular species here. This is an oceanic white tip. And again, it's somewhat of a recognizable shark. It's a large species, but most people don't usually encounter this one. Unlike the white shark and the tiger shark, which tend to be coastal, this species tends to be oceanic and fairly far offshore. Now, when I was a grad student, uh, back in the eight, 1980s, we, you know, we went on an expedition, we took a research vessel, went on up to the Mozambique border uh, of South Africa, and we're putting down these deep set long lines, putting them down like three, 4,000 feet to try to find out what types of deep sea sharks were out there. And so while we we're waiting there, we kind of like, you know, it's hot, you're in the tropics. And so we put on our mask, our fins and jump over the side of the boat and go snorkeling around. And it was some of the clearest water you'll ever see. And so it was, you know, kind of cooling off and just seeing what's out there. And just, you could see just, just amazing distance. And after about 90 minutes, we figured, okay, well, let's get out of the water and get back to work here. And so we got out, got back on the boat. And within about five, 10 minutes, somebody goes, hey, take a look over here. And under the boat, there's like 12, 15 oceanic white tips swimming around. And like in the entire time we were in the water, there's like six of us, nobody saw any sharks. But those sharks were around. We just didn't see them. And they came in, you know, they didn't just come in from Australia, but they were obviously around. And, and sharks, just most shark species tend to get very what's called habituated towards boats because they know a lot of times there's food availability. Now, part of why I tell you this story is because these sharks were there and they're not, it's not like they're actively like looking for, you know, people to go eat because we clearly could have been in a bad situation. Of course, I'm thinking like it could have been, it could have been a bad situation because most of the research, shark research community at the time was on, the, on this cruise with me. And, um, and so like, so the, from the category of you learn from experience and that wisdom and age thing is now that I'm a, I'm, I'm a, 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 on the faculty at a Moss Landing Marine Laboratory. We have grad students, we go out in the field. It's like students, you know, you're kind of eager and young, like, I want to go in the water first. Go get them guys. Um, I'm happy to stand back. I'll let you take that one and see how it works out. But 
while these sharks that I've just talked about are large and toothy and the three I showed are, you know, three of the four most dangerous sharks in the world, along with the bull shark, the sharks that I'm most fascinated in are what I call the lost sharks. And these shar are sharks that come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. You got things from like the whale shark, which gets up to 60 feet. And to put that in perspective, a school bus only gets about 45 feet long. This thing's bigger than a school bus. Now it is, it is a shark that's fairly distinctive because well, it's the biggest fish in the world. And it also has a very distinctive checkerboard color pattern. And so people do recognize, and there are places you can go do some ecotourism dives more in, more in warm water tropical areas. But what people don't think about is in a lot of parts of the world, you have things like this little uh, uh, spine pygmy shark that doesn't get any bigger than the palm of your hand. It's just, a, and that's as big as a shark gets. And people don't, you know, I try to tell people like, we well, you know, of all the sharks out there, over 80% of the sharks don't get bigger than about five or six feet long. 50% of all shark species don't get more than three feet long. So they're not even, so most of the species out there, people often don't recognize the sharks because they're just very small species. And a lot of them do live in deep water. Some are more coastal, but they're just things that people don't always think of as sharks. You have other sharks that get are very specialized, like this cookie cutter shark. This shark only gets about two feet long, but it has the largest teeth relative to its body size of any shark in the world. And this thing has very, it's, it's basically, it's a parasite. It has very it's like sectoral lips and it will go up to like tunas and whales and dolphins and it grabs onto them and it takes a cookie cutter bite out of it. And so I, I, I like to show this one because like, as I say, this thing has larger teeth relative to its body than a white shark. And it's very specialized in how it feeds. And a lot of sharks, as, you, as we learn more about them, are very specialized in the types of stuff and the types of things they eat. Now, when people think of sharks, they tend to think of things like, well, like, the, uh, like this goblin shark here, you know, which is, pink, which is a shark when it's alive, it's pink with blue fins. People tend to think that sharks are kind of brown or black or gray. Who thinks of a shark being pink with blue fins? Well, here you have a species that actually is that way. And, and as you get to learn more about some different shark species, you'll, have the, you'll see they have a whole variety of different color patterns. And I'll show you some here and just, I'll show you a few different ones in just a moment. You have other species here that like the six gill shark, which has six gills on each, on each side is where it gets its name from. Now, a cool trivia question you can always pull in your friends is that most species of sharks, in fact, the vast majority of them have five gills. None have less than four gills. There's a few species that have six and there's two species that have seven. And so if you want to screw around with your artist friends, like when, for some reason, when artists do drawings of sharks many times, unless they're, they're, they're knowledgeable about, about sharks, they'll often put three or four gills on there and they'll show you like, hey, look at this really cool shark I illustrated. And you always zero in on the gills, like, well, they put five gills or less than five gills. And so it's always kind of a fun thing to see, to see just how accurate it is. But the six gill shark for me has kind of a bit of a sentimental <clears throat> value to it in that the six gill and the seven gill were the two species that I really started my career on nearly 40 years ago. And when I started out my master's degree at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, I was looking around for something to do, something, I wanted to do something different, something unique. And so I went up and, and, and met the uh, director of the Steinhardt Aquarium at the time, who was, who was a shark expert in the area, Dr. John McCosker. And I was telling him about like what I really want to do something different. I didn't want to do like something everybody else was doing. And of course, that time, you know, shark research was very new. And he said, well, you know, Dave, there's these sharks out here in the bay, seven gill sharks and six gill sharks. And they're pretty large and they're easy to get. And we have them on display here at the aquarium, but we know nothing about them. And so I was all it took was just an idea. And I thought this was great. So I Went back down to Moss Landing. I was super excited. I, I went into my professor, Greg Kaye's office. I said, Greg, I'm going to work on six and seven gill sharks. Greg sits back and he goes, you mean Notorhynchus and Hexanchus? And I go, look at him, I go, what's that? And he kind of shakes his head and he goes, get out of my office and don't come into my office until you know the scientific name of the sharks you're going to work on because you're clearly not prepared and there's no point in you wasting your time and my time. Now, it was kind of depressing a little bit, well, it was deflating to be honest, but you know, he had a point and it was a valuable life lesson learned because why am I in there wasting his time and my time and I didn't even know what the species was. I was happy I had a project to work on, but it's something that really, you know, I've carried through life since then and that is something you should always think about is being prepared. When you, whether it's going to see an advisor, 
uh, an employer, you know, whatever you, you know, prepare yourself ahead of time. So I went, I went back, did my research, did my homework. And a week or two later, I came back and went and met Greg in his office and we had a great meeting, but I was prepared for it. And he was ready to, to help me and give me some guidance and let me know where to go. So it's always that, that thing about being prepared as you go, you know, when you come into things, whatever situation you are in life. Now, back to these lost sharks. Now, I mentioned the, the goblin shark, the shark that was pink with blue fins. Well, there's a, here's another example of a really colorful kind of variegated pattern of bars and spots on it. And this is what's called a shy shark. Now, this is a species that's known only from South Africa. It occurs, in fact, there's a little group of them. There's about four species that occur along the coast in South Africa and nowhere else in the world. And they get their name, shy shark, because they're real common to see diving. And if you come up to them and you kind of grab them or something or bother them, what they do is they curl up in a ball and they put their tail fin over their eyes, which is where they get their name, shy shark. Now, this particular species, the scientific name is Haplobleferus edwardsii. And for short, we used to call them happy eddies. Now, now they're happy because they're kind of a cute little shy, cute little shy shark. You see, they're kind of happy going about their business. Except when you go up there and you grab them and you harass them, and then they curl up and they turn and put their tail over their eyes, and they're not such a happy little shark. So it's not really good to go harass them. I'm not advocating that, but it's just kind of an interesting behavior these things do. You have other sharks, such as like a Pinocchio cat shark, which, as you might imagine by the name Pinocchio, it has a really long snout. And this particular shark, it has a lot of what are called ampullae, which are sensory organs on its snout. This, this shark lives really deep in the ocean and it navigates because it's in a dark environment, a lot of times using this electroreception from these, from these, electro, from these ampullae on its snout. You have other species that are called like a ninja lantern shark, which gets its name because it's kind of dark and stealthy. And that was kind of a cool name we came up with one of my students, Vicky Vasquez, you know, work had some had some school kids uh, who were partly who were cousins at work came up with this really cool name that fit the shark. And it was really kind of a neat, it's kind of a really neat thing to see for having getting some students engaged and actually coming up with a name for a shark. And that's probably been one of the most well-known sharks we've we have ever have ever named, just because of that it was kind of a cool name they came up with. But why people don't think of some of those things as sharks, people don't often think of things like this. This is a this is a skate. And skates and rays are actually really sharks. And if you really, what you do, if you take a shark and you flatten it, it basically, it's, it's a ray. And so, the, so there's really, it's just basically a ray is a flat shark. And if you say, sometimes you say ray or skate with people, you know, they just kind of like look at you like, oh, okay, what's the big deal? But if you say flat shark, because it's got the word shark in it, it get, people get excited about it. And so a lot of times they'll use the term flat shark to get some interest in it because a lot of these ray groups are actually, from a conservation standpoint are more critically endangered than a lot of the shark species. But again, trying to get people interested in these things is very, it can be very difficult. Also, in addition to the flat sharks, you have another group of sharks, which are called ghost sharks. And similarly, these are, all, these are also known as chimeras, ratfish, uh, uh, water bunnies. And, and, but you, know, you mentioned those names and people just sort of look at you like, yeah, what's the big deal? But you say ghost shark, then it gets people's attention out of them. And they are called ghost sharks in many parts of the world. And the cool thing about this and the flat sharks and the, what you consider like the true sharks is that this group of fishes is all united by the fact that they have a cartilaginous skeleton. Now, most sharks, or excuse me, most fishes have a bony skeleton, okay, like, like we have bone. And that's the vast majority of, of, of fishes are these bony fishes. There's over 33, 34,000 species of these bony fishes compared to a much smaller number of these sharks and skates and rays and chimeras. And kind of a kind of funny, uh, kind of an interesting little thing I like to always brag about is that of, of these ghost sharks, which are kind of an archaic group, there's not a lot of them now. If you went back several million years, they're, they're actually more abundant. But these, these, these ghost sharks, you know, my lab in the, over the last uh, couple decades has named about 20, almost 25% of all the known species have been discovered and named by my lab at Moss Landing Marine Labs, which I think is a pretty cool thing. And in fact, we've actually discovered a couple of new ghost sharks right off here, uh, off here in California, which you think like, you know, here we are in California, which is you know, Silicon Valley, high tech, you know, we've got 40 million people here. You think like there's nothing left to discover here. Well, actually we have discovered some new sharks here. And I, I, 
tell you that because a lot of people think like everything's been discovered. And yet here we have, we're still discovering new shark species off California of all places. So I don't even have to really, if I didn't want to go that far from home, there's things right here to look for. And we do. Now, this leads me into like another question I frequently get like, you know, well, Dave, well, how many sharks are there out there? Well, I, well, I just told you there's 33, 34,000 species of bony fish. But if I, if I asked you like how many species of sharks are there, you know, people might throw out like 20, 50, 100. They're kind of guessing because they don't really know. Well, if I tell you that there's over 1,250 species of sharks, people are just flabbergasted. They have no idea there's that many species of sharks which leads to another question like, well, have we discovered all the sharks out there? And the answer is no. If you look at this chart here, and you can see like just between 1758 and 18, 1899, over 141 year time period, you know, we had about 420 species of sharks named, which is an average of about three a year. And the first, most, through most of the 20th century from 1900 to 1979, we had 429 species about five a year named. But in the last 40 years, since 1980, we've had nearly as many species named, over 424, as we've had in, the, in all the previous, you know, 100, 100, 100 to 235 years. And so I, I emphasize that to people, you know, like we're naming almost, during this last 40 years, we've named almost, uh, almost 16, almost 12 species a year. But over the last 15 years, we've named about 16 species a year. So rather than slowing down, there's more out there to be discovered. And I try to emphasize that whatever your profession, whether you're doing sharks or whatever field you go into, again, when you're a young person, you tend to think everything's been done, but it's not. And that's where like thinking out, you know, thinking, I try to emphasize to people, I think outside the box. You know, if you're going to like sort of run with the herd or swim with the school, you're just doing what everybody else is doing. But if you want to really advance in your field and learn something, learn, educate yourself about whatever your particular field is. What it comes down to is, do you want to be an explorer or do you want to be a settler? Because the mindset's very different in what you're going to do. And if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be an explorer, you're going to be off taking a journey on what I call the road less traveled. So it's kind of really cool to go out and, and, and out on a boat and collect some, collect a new species and stuff. But oftentimes when you collect something, you don't really know if it's a new species. Once in a while, you have that sort of eureka moment that you think like, wow, that's definitely new. But most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you're not really sure. So you come back to your, you know, I come back to my lab or my students and we'll start the real investigation, which is basically similar to a CSI investigation. So the crime scene, it's a shark scene investigation. And this is kind of the, really the fun part because it's like a shark forensics uh, to do. because so you got to really start to do the investigation and piece everything together. And it's, it's literally, it's like an investigation Pro project to go through. And this is actually the, this is actually kind of fun because when you name a new species, you can't just say, oh, it's a new species. You have to go through and document why it's different. You have to write up a scientific paper. It has to get uh, published in a peer-reviewed professional journal before that name can be accepted. And what I tell students, you know, you can publish a bunch of papers in your career, but the one thing when you describe a new species, the cool thing is, the, that specimen that your species is, is named off of, it becomes what's called a holotype. And that's the species that everything's based on. So if someone later on thinks they have a similar species that's different, they need to compare that to that specimen. And that specimen becomes basically an archive and it goes into a museum. The publication that goes with that basically becomes a historical document. And, and the, the cool thing is, you know, you can have your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, generations from now can go find that document and find that specimen and that name will always be attributed to you. So this is something unlike a lot of pub, most publications that kind of, you know, after they've been published, they kind of fall by the wayside. These things, these things will always be around because it's literally, it's, it's a historical document. Now, a question I get is like, well, that's kind of cool. You go out and you discover these really neat different things, Dave, but you know, why, why should I care about that? Well, I think about it in this terms. If these things, lions and elephants and gorillas, polar bears and a number of other species, if they disappeared, people would be upset about it. Now, most of us, most of you will never see these things in the wild, but the fact that they're out there 
and it's in your public conscience. And there are organizations dedicated to trying to preserve and conserve these different species. You know, there's a connection that people have, especially with their, especially with these being, you know, land animals, terrestrial animals versus things, you know, things that live in the ocean, which, you know, you hear that expression oftentimes, you know, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know in the ocean. That is true because there's a lot of stuff we don't know. But these, but, but while people pay attention to these sort of high profile species, and I could throw the white shark in there, which is very well protected. People don't often think about things like this. This is a honeycomb cat shark. Now this species hasn't been seen since 1972, despite doing a lot of intensive biodiversity surveys. And I've been involved in a number of those uh, since, well, not since 1972, I was a little kid at that time. Um, but this species was not named officially until 2006, 34 years after it disappeared. Now, we know this thing used to be common off the east coast of South Africa and southern Mozambique, because we have records and documents and photographs, these things. And we knew they used to be caught, but then they just disappeared. And a colleague of mine, Brett Human, um, when he's doing his, his PhD in the early 2000s, came and found these things in some museum collections in South Africa and named this thing. But here you have a species that we haven't seen in decades now, that in nearly 50 years we haven't seen this thing that didn't even have a name until, until 14 years ago. You have other things here like this missing speckled cat shark. This was named, discovered and named in 1972. And we haven't seen this thing since 1991. It's just, it's just we don't know what happened with this thing. And again, a lot of this, another species occurs in East Africa, but in a lot of these areas of the world that are not well surveyed, you know, these things may be around, we, we just don't know because they're not well surveyed in a lot of these areas. And that's one of the things that I do is try to go to these different places to find these things. Now, probably one of the, amongst the lost shark world, probably the most iconic species that people think about is what's called the Pondicherry shark. And this was named in Pondicherry, India in 1839. It's only known from just a handful of specimens, 20 or 30 or so, but we haven't seen this shark since the 70s now. And this is another shark that we think just may have just vanished. And so, you know, you, th you think about like, well, you know, I could spend a whole hour here, just go off one species after another. You know, I'm just giving you three examples here of sharks that we haven't seen in decades. Now, maybe they're there and just nobody's bothered to look for them, but it's kind of cool. And I'll talk a little more later about how this whole uh, passion of mine to look for these things has kind of led me in a whole journey in life that I never really expected when I set out. But the thing with these sharks and rays, is that white sharks people recognize, and as I mentioned a couple times already, white sharks are very well protected. But these species I'm showing you now, these are the proverbial, these are the canaries in the coal mine, because they may tell us more about what's going on in the environment than the white shark. Because the white sharks, as I say, is something you recognize. These other sharks, I'm sure most of you have never heard of before today. And so these are the ones that are gonna tell us more about what's going on. And if you, have, if you haven't heard the expression canary in the coal mine, Back before we had modern technology, coal mi miners would take a, take a cage with a canary in it and lower it down to a mine shaft and leave it down for a few minutes and pull it back up. And if the canary was alive, it was safe to go down in the mine shaft, it was dead. It meant there were toxic gases down there and they couldn't go down there. And so that's why I kind of look at these things as being really important to, to know something about. Now, question I get often time, which is cool, I always have fun like trying to answer is like, where do you, where do you find lost sharks? Well, there's all kinds of places you can find them. You can find them dancing on stage with Katy Perry during a Super Bowl halftime. And if you're counting, by the way, they did have five gill slits on this. So they, whoever did the costumes knew what they were doing. But I've also had sharks sometimes show up in the mail. I was working on a new species of shark uh, several years ago with one of my gr former grad students. And we, a lot, when, you, again, when you're working on a new species, you have to look at comparative things, species that are similar to it. So we re requested some uh, specimens from a museum and when they showed up there we opened up the box my student looked at it and said those don't look right and I said nope I think we just got another new species so in that case we ended up having two new species to describe instead of one and that's actually helped happen to me several times where I thought I was working on one species and I as I was investigating it comparing it, I came across a second species so you never know where these things are going to show up I've also been out doing tv shows for shark week and this is a little lantern shark we caught in Tokyo Bay and again, Tokyo Bay, just for perspective, it's one of the most heavily traveled bays in the world as far as shipping and shipping containers. It's just a very active bay. And here we're out in this particular show where I was out with my student, Vicki, 
Vasquez and we're out trying to get some, uh, get these goblin sharks for the show. And we caught this, we caught this little lantern shark and I had one of my Japanese colleagues with, with me and him and I looked at this and we're just like doing fist pumps. Yeah, this is like, this looks like a new species. And of course the TV crew is filming this going like, what's so exciting about that? We got a goblin shark over here. And we're like, yeah, we know what a goblin shark is, but here we got a whole new species, something new to science we found here in this, in this trip. And so you never know where you find them. And, and, and it's been kind of cool to be out doing a TV show and actually stumble across an entirely new species of shark. But now, while it's kind of cool to go out on a boat and find a new species of shark, you're really, you're just like one person on one boat in the big vast ocean. The best place to really find sharks is, and what I do frequently is I go to fishing villages all over the world, places that you know most people have never heard of before. And, and yet there's these, a lot of these fishing activities going on. You have, and you know, like I'll go to these villages and there'll be like, there literally would be a hundred boats out every day fishing fishing for me and I'm thinking like well they're great they're fishing for me although they're actually just fishing for the village um, but I like to think they're doing something for me um, but your chances of finding something new or different and I've been talking a lot about new sharks but a lot of times I find shark species that are known species but we'll find them in area we'll find them in places we didn't even know they occurred before and that's a big problem in a lot of these a lot of these more remote parts of the world where you just don't find things you know, a lot of times I well, say so you find things, but people just didn't know because there's no identification guides. And unless someone like myself, who's knowledgeable about, about sharks and rays, they don't even know these things occur. And one of the cool parts of this whole thing that I have, that I enjoy, is talking to the fishermen. And because these guys have a lot of traditional knowledge, they have generations of information that they get, that they, they learn from, you know, that I can learn from. Literally, they, these guys can go back, you know, multiple, multiple generations, hundreds of years, and so they have a, and they, it's all passed down by voice, you know, by, by oral, oral history. And it's just, I have a fascinating time. And, and as you might think, like a lot of these places, they don't speak English. So I usually, as I'll explain a little later, have usually work with some of the local, local people, NGOs, universities, or, uh, in, in, that are there that can help with translation and getting around. But this is, this, this is a pretty amazing. And, and this particular place here, this is an interesting story I, I, I teased on the social media. A few months before I went to Sri Lanka a couple of years ago, I had a colleague in Sri Lanka sent me a picture on, on my phone and of this really strange shark that was caught. And he didn't know what it was. And I looked at this thing and go, man, I think this might be a new species of shark. I, I've never seen anything. I'm not quite sure what that is. I've never seen anything like that. So a few months later, when I went to Sri Lanka, I made a point. I said, guys, I want to go to this village. And so we went to this place and I showed... I showed the, uh, the, these fishermen this picture of this shark that had been caught here a couple months ago. And the guys kind of looked at me and like, okay, yeah, come back tomorrow. I was like, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. So the next day I come back and they caught one. And I was just, I was just ecstatic. I mean, I was like doing cartwheels, fist pump. I was just, I was, they thought this lunatic American guys running around, but I was so, I couldn't believe these guys brought one in. And, and after I kind of calmed down, I, I, kind of, I asked them, I says, do you guys catch these very often? And they said, oh yeah, we caught three yesterday. We just throw them back, they're not worth anything. So here's an entirely new species of shark that's being, that's being caught and just thrown away because they don't need it, which is, well, it's good for the shark that it gets to swim off. But, you know, but we have no idea. If I wouldn't have gone to this village to look for this thing, or my friend wouldn't have said, hey, I got this weird shark I've seen, I don't know what it is. If this thing would still be out there. We'd have no idea what this species is. So that to me is, to me is the really the cool thing. Cause for me, it's like every day is like Christmas. And, and this, this is one of the more, one of the best, more recent sharks I got. This is, it's an Eastern, uh, it's an Eastern dwarf uh, false cat shark. And it's only the second shark species in this particular genus that's ever been caught. I and mean, we know it occurs in Sri Lanka and India now. So that was, again, that's the kind of stuff I, I live for this stuff. It's just, cause I, as you can tell, I just get really excited to go out and look for it. I'll show you a few others, just kind of, of some of the variety of things I've, of, the, of the 50 or so species I've, I've done to date so far. You, just, you can see I've done some different rays and skates and, and sharks and, and ghost sharks and just kind of a variety of all these sort of cartilaginous fishes that occur all over the world. But one in particular has a lot of special sentiment to me, for me, and that's this particular thing. Now, this is a saw shark not to be confused with a saw fish. And the reason the difference between those, even though they're both you know, cartilaginous fishes, is a saw, is a saw shark is a, is a much smaller species. It only gets up to maybe three or four or five feet. And, and it has the gills in the sides of its head. Whereas a saw fish 
some of those will get up to be 15 feet or more, and they have the gills are underneath the head, so it's quite different. But why this one has some special meaning to me is that this one I named after my niece Lana in recognition of her graduation from, from college. And it was really kind of a special thing because it's one of these things I mentioned earlier. This thing will always have her name associated to it. And her great grandkids can go to the California Academy of Sciences someday, 100 years from now, and actually see this species. And it's really kind of cool because she was actually the, in my family, she was actually the, the first girl to ever actually get a college degree. So it was, it was pretty cool and I was very excited. I wanted to do something very special and very memorable. Plus also she, she did her degree in nursing, which I'm hoping that I'll get some bonus points later on when old Uncle Dave is kind of old and decrepit and he needs some nursing help. Um, hopefully you'll remember I named a shark, a shark after her. And not to be outdone, my nephew, when he graduated a few years later, I named a, I named a species after him, Austin's, Austin's Guitar Shark, which actually was, all, was in the recent uh, Shark Week program I did. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. So while well, it's kind of cool to do a lot of this stuff and, and do these things, you know, I got a question I often get from people, well, how did, how did you do this stuff, Dave? How did you get out and go, go you know, what, what, what inspired you to do this? And, it's, and, I, and, it, and, and it's a great question because I like, it's a great question I like to talk about. And so for me, when I was like about five years old, my parents gave me a book on sharks. And of course I'm five years old and I thought, you know, I thought these were like the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And you know, and you look, and we still have my, my mom still has the book and I look at it now. It's like, they're okay. They're not bad. But, but what amazed me was just the different types of sharks, like a hammerhead shark and a few different types of species. Cause back then when I was like five years old, we didn't really know all that much about the different types of sharks, but I was just mesmerized by these things. And so when I got a little older, I was about 10, I was still thinking like, man, these things are the coolest things. You know, my parents were thinking like, that's okay, he's 10, he'll grow out of it, you know, because when you're young, you know, sharks, dinosaurs, whales are always kind of cool. But I'm thinking like when I'm 10, like, okay, I want to study sharks, I want to travel the world, and I want to figure out a way to get paid to do that. I had no idea how I was going to get from here to here. I didn't, I mean, I knew what the end game was, I just didn't know how I was going to get there. But, you know, it was like a big adventure. And, you know, and, you know, it's like, it's, it's like stepping off in the unknown without knowing really what comes next. Because if you know what comes next, it's not really an adventure. And that's why I just thought this would be the coolest thing. And I want to go do something different, something that other people were not doing. And so I went on, went, went through high school and, and on to college. And, and, and you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was, you know, I was an okay student. I was sort of average. I wasn't great, but I just had this drive that I knew what I wanted to do. And when I was finishing up, when I was finishing up, uh, my college degree, my bachelor's degree, um, a professor I knew kind of, you know, came up and started talking to me a little bit and asked me what I was going to do. And I says, well, I'm, I'm going to go travel the world and study sharks. And he's like, oh, that's cute. That's nice. Let's go have a cup of coffee and talk. And he's one of these people you tend to meet in life, you know, and, you know, he's, he's a professor. And we went and talked. And he says, you know, Dave, yeah, you can go out and you can study sharks if you want. But, you know, with a bachelor's degree, you know, you're really just going to be like a technician in a lot of these things. You really need to think about grad school. And I'm thinking grad school, like, you know, I'm like only, you know, first one in my, my, in my family to get a college degree. And you're telling me to go on to grad school. That's, you know, that's literally like taking off to Namibia with a compass and a map, but I don't even have a compass and a map. I was just like going off into the unknown. But he said, if you want to like really lead expeditions and you want to be sort of the captain of your ship, you really need to think about at least getting a master's degree. So I took his word to heart and I looked at it, I did some research into where some shark programs and coincidentally, again, this was in the 1980s. There wasn't really a lot of opportunities at that time because shark research was kind of new. So I found a program, which coincidentally was at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, which was just a couple miles from where I grew up. You know, I'm from the Monterey area. So I made an appointment. I went down and again, this is like my last semester in college for my bachelor's. I went down there and I talked to Greg Kaye. And we had a really good meeting, you know, at that, at that time, because I was a little prepared when I went in to see him. I really didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I wanted to work on sharks. We had a really good meeting. And, and at the end of the meeting, you know, I said, I said, oh, you know, I, you know, I, I asked him, like, what are the chances you think I can get in? Because, you know, my, my grades aren't really great. And he said, he's kind of sat back and he goes, oh, don't worry, Dave, getting in is not your problem. Getting out is going to be your problem. And uh, which I thought was pretty which was funny, because I talk to my students nowadays, they tell you how much things have changed. Like, I ask them like, you know, a lot of them were AP students like in high school and, and stuff. And, and nowadays, I guess AP means advanced placement. Now that's a big change because back when I was in high school and college, AP meant academic probation, which I was very familiar with at the time. 
So things have changed in all this time. But the point is, like, you know, I, was, I, was a, I wasn't a bad student, but I was sort of average. But I just, what, what ca has carried me along on this whole thing in life was just being, a, was just having this focus and this drive. And the other thing is, you know, Greg, you know, when I met with him, and you, and you have these opportunities in life, like, I didn't know, I had no idea if I could do a grad, grad degree. I didn't even know if I could get in. But he let me in. And that's all it took because he gave me that opportunity to, to pursue my dream. Now, what I did with it, that was up to me. But he gave the opportunity. And I, I, I emphasize that because when you're given an opportunity in life, you know, it's really up to you to succeed or fail. It's, it's really the, the ball's in your court. You can't blame anybody else. I couldn't blame Greg if I didn't finish. There was no one else to blame. It was all on me. But the fact he gave me that opportunity was all I really needed. And with that opportunity, I took off. And I got, I really went after it to go into, to go into studying sharks. And I really delved into it. Now, as I was going along, uh, getting into doing my research, and I, was, and I was working on sharks, I came across, I met an individual, a fellow named Leonard Capagno. Now, at this particular time, Leonard was the shark expert in the world. And he, coincidentally, he lived in, San, in the San Francisco area, and he worked out of the Tiburon Marine Lab, which is just over the, over the, over the Golden Gate Bridge on the opposite side of San Francisco. And coincidentally, I was out, out fishing one day, and he kind of came, this guy came by, and I started talking to him. And I got to know him and we got to be, and, and over the next couple of years, we got to be pretty good friends. And Leonard actually, by the way, he had actually worked on the original Jaws movie and he was the guy that actually designed the mechanical shark Bruce for the movie. Steven Spielberg flew him down and everything. So that was kind of a cool little connection there. Um, but Leonard took a job at the end, as, as I was finishing up there, Leonard took a job in, in South Africa to uh, go start a re-shark research program down there. And so as, as he was leaving, you know, as he was heading off, you know, we had a little, you know, got together, had lunch with him and talked. And kind of the last thing I said to him, I said, you know, if you ever need anybody to carry your bags, you know, let me know. I'd be able to volunteer. And not thinking anything would really come of it. Well, eight months later, I got a phone call from Leonard in South Africa. Hey, Dave, I have a PhD position here. Would you like it? And it happened. From the time I was 10 to now I was 28, I was off. I was going, I was fulfilling my life dream to travel the world and study sharks. And that was all it took. Again, he gave me an opportunity. I wasn't even sure I could do a PhD at that point, but I didn't care. I was going to South Africa. I was going to travel. I was going to study sharks. I was going to get paid to do it. And it was the most incredible experience I ever had. And from there, I've just gone on from there. I've been to six continents, traveled to over 35 countries, discovered species on, on almost every continent. And it's just, it just had an amazing time throughout this entire journey. But again, it was getting that opportunity to do something. You know, I mean, and, and, and some, I'll talk about in a little, little in a few minutes about another another part of the whole journey that's been that was been pretty amazing that I never expected along the way. Now, as I've been doing, as I mentioned, I've been doing this for almost forty years now. And this is a thing in life: if you can find something you love to do, you're passionate about it you know, and you're still got that same excitement. I mean, I'm, I get as excited today as I did before. And to give you a little thing, I'm gonna show you a little clip from this recent TV show I did with Extinct or Alive, Land of the Lost Sharks. And it was with Forrest Galante, who has a program on Animal Planet called Extinct or Alive. And, and because people know me as sort of the lost shark guy, I've got a you know, reputation, I get called most of the time if there's a show on TV that doesn't involve white sharks or something, I'm usually the guy they call. And they contacted me and they said, like, we'd like to go do this, this program. We'd like to see if we can find more than one shark. I said, well, I know a place we can go where we can try to find three species of sharks. And let me just show you a little clip here. The flat-nosed hound shark that we're targeting tonight. So if we catch one, answer what kind of questions? If we can get a tag on one tonight, get some information on its movement pattern. We have no idea where these things are. This will be first information on this particular lost shark. fishing rod is one of the oldest tools biologists use for studying and tagging aquatic wildlife. Wind's gone dead, eh? Yeah. yeah. I gotta check my bait. I just got bit. That was a good bite, too. Nice hard thumb. Yeah, look, you can see it right there. Just went 
bam, it ripped me off there. But it's a good sign. Oh, that's better. Ooh. Fish! We got a fish! Fish. Come on, come on. Yes. Hold on. Take the rod, Dave. Take the rod. I'm going to land it. Right? Hey, real, 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 real. I got him. Holy crap. You know, as you just saw there in the little clip there, we got one of the species we we're looking for. In fact, we got all three of the species we went to look for. And when we went to look for them, I mean, I knew which ones to go look for. And again, I, I know kind of where to go look for these things. But when we did this show, we had no idea if we're going to find these or not. And that's to me, is the cool part of the whole program. We really had no idea. I knew where to go look for these things. I knew a species to go look for. And this flat-nosed hound shark, this was a species that was named in 1902. And for over 100 years, there'd only been a couple records of this thing ever until recently. We found a spot where we know we can go catch these things. We put on a satellite tag in this thing and released it. Now we got some information on where these things actually move because they seem to have a very narrow range. And, there, and just as a spoiler alert, if you hadn't seen the show, we had two other species we went to find. One was an ornate sleep array, which hadn't been seen in, in, in a couple of decades. And the big one we went to find was what's called a white tip weasel shark, which was known from one specimen caught in 1984, and we'd never seen it since then. And we got that one. That was a big one to get too. In fact, we found a couple of them. So here were three species that we really didn't know about anything until we got to do this. And, and the kind of the nice thing with doing some of these TV shows is that I could never get funding to support. No one, no normal funding agency or foundation would normally fund to go look for this stuff. But these TV shows, I have to tell you, they're great. And, and, this, and the information I got out of this, this is data that'll actually get published. And some of this information will actually be used in my upcoming Sharks of the World book. So it's having an immediate impact on what we know about, about sharks out there. And it's a cool thing. And the thing is with these shows, like it's nothing I ever planned to do. I had no interest or no, no, never thought about doing, doing these shows. And I never contacted them. They just contact me. But, just one, but as you can tell from that thing is I get excited like that, whether there's a TV camera there or not. I get excited like that all the time. As I mentioned earlier, when we got the, uh, that shark in Sri Lanka, I was you know, doing, literally doing cartwheels. And I was just glad I didn't hurt myself on the beach there. And I said, that was a time you should have had a camera rolling, but I was, you know, I was just off doing a normal, a regular survey without the camera on. So the thing is, if you can find something you're passionate about and something you love, and you can make it into a career where you're 40 years from now, you're still as passionate about it as you've had a great career and you've had a wonderful life to still have that type, type of excitement. Now, I want to like, now I've told you a little bit how my journey's taken me from basically from Prunedale, California to, you know, travel around the world and everything. I want to share with you some, a few things on how you can get the most out of, out of your journey, whatever road you choose in life. And it's all these things that are kind of simple or things you've probably heard from before, but I'm talking to you from someone who's experienced and who's done it in my, during my career. <clears throat> one, one of the things is work hard. Work smart, but hard. And I told you about one of the life lessons I learned early in life was prepare, be prepared. And, you know, and also, and, you know, if, and, you know, life's competitive. If you want to get to the top of your field, you need, you need to be on it. You need to be competitive. And I was, I happened to be an athlete growing up. And so that gave me a bit of a com competitive feel. But you don't have to necessarily be an athlete, but you just got to like, for me, you know, I'm up at five, six in the morning and I'm checking what's going on in the email and I'm on my project. I already got whatever project I'm working on you know, lined up for the day. And, and the thing is, you know, cause, cause I might not, I may lose out on something, but I'm not going to lose because I'm sleepy. You know, somebody might come up with a better proposal or come up with a, a, a write it, write something better or produce something or find a shark before me, but I'm not going to lose out because I'm sleepy because I'm going to get out there. And I'm going to do my best to try to try to do it. So work. So I can't emphasize enough. It's one of these things like, you know, work hard, you know, and, and it will pay dividends for you. Another thing is you find from people that are successful, and I've, I've looked at this as well, you know, you find that, you know, they, they have a certain sort of an interesting view on, on, on success and failure. You look at some people like here, you have Michael Jordan, you know, got cut from his high school basketball team, and you know, he went on to have a pretty good career. You had Walt Disney got fired by an editor because he lacked imagination. You know, now you, most of you are familiar with the, the Disney Corporation. And, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, you know, Disney Sunday night was a big, was a big thing. 
You have J.K. Rowling, who you know got rejected by twelve uh, publishers before getting her Harry Potter her Harry uh, Potter series finally published. And an interesting story with her, and I read in, a, in an interview one time, is that you know, here was someone you know who was a single mom, was on government subsidies, and working and just trying to write in her spare time. And she and they asked her about like you know, these, these getting, you know, being rejected. And she, she looked at, she was, this was liberating for me because then she wrote what she did things that she, the way she wanted to do. She wasn't trying to do what other people wanted to do. She wrote what she wanted to do. And so, you know, a thing to think about is, you know, if failure is not an option, then neither is success. You're not going to show up the first day and sink the winning basket or start a major corporation or write, you know, a, a series of novels. But, you know, if you work at it, and you learn from your setbacks and, and you know where to work. And this is where coming working harder at it because if you, you know where, you, okay, I didn't make it here, but I'm going to keep, keep working on this, you know, going forward. So, you know, you can't, let, you can't let setbacks get in the way. You need to keep pushing forward because you know where you want to be. You might have to take a little different road to get there, but as long as you know where you want to go, you have that focus and that drive. The other thing is I found is, you know, it's against a simple thing, but, you know, as you go along in life, you know, be kind to people. I've met people all over the world. Many I've never, you know, met one or two times early on and never had a chance to meet. But other people I've met 30 or more years ago, I'm still friends with. The bottom picture here, a couple of my Chinese uh, colleagues in Taiwan. Um, you know, I met these guys in 1988 when the first time I went to Taiwan. And the guy in the middle is Captain Chen. He was a boat captain there. And the guy next to him, uh, Professor Zhuang, you know, he's like one of the top shark guys in Taiwan now. And him and I were both grad students at the same time. And we got to be friends many years ago. And like, I'll go back to Taiwan every few years now. And, you know, Captain Chen will see me come walking down the thing. and He's kind of waving and, he, and he'll take and show me the sharks that are he's catching. And, and, you know, and what I've been able to do in this particular vi village for over 30 years now is document the changes in the shark catch during this time, which is pretty, pretty remarkable because most people, you don't have a chance to actually document changes in a shark uh, in, 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 in shark fisheries in many areas. And this has been kind of a cool thing, but a lot of it just has to do with getting to know people, you know, being kind to them as you go along the way. And I have a picture here of some of my grad students, which I, one of the, gives me one of the biggest pleasures I have now is, is working with my students and seeing them take off and go off on their road and on their journey. But there's one guy, young man I like to talk about here. And this is my young friend, Abdallah. And this is a young man I met about a year and a half ago in Zanzibar. Now, when I go into a lot of, a lot of these sort of <clears throat> places, a lot of these out of way places, I usually try to connect with people. He works for a, a, an NGO called the, the Wildlife Conservation Society. And he, he, he goes around to the fish markets there and documents the types of sharks and rays they're catching. As I mentioned earlier, in a lot of these areas, you don't have guides or anything to work from. So they're trying to work the best as they can to identify them. So, you know, having an opportunity to work with someone like myself, you know, coming here is just, you know, golden for him. And we actually ran an identification workshop where they, we had people come in from around Zanzibar to, to and I, I spent a day. And it was a really cool experience for me because these guys all speak Swahili. And so, we, and so uh, um, Abdullah translated the, the language in, into, uh, from, into, from English into Swahili, which is a great experience to do. And these, were, these could have been the nicest, more generous guys to, to work with. But while I was there, him and I would go to the fish markets every day. And, and so one day, you know, Nabdella's there like, you know, I'd go down to meet him in the hotel lobby there and he's like 10, 15 minutes early. Um, and, but one day, you know, I was, went down there to meet him and he wasn't there. I thought it wasn't a big deal, you know, I wait around. And he came up about five, 10 minutes late. Again, it wasn't a big deal. He had plenty of time to go to the fish market. And he starts apologizing to me profusely about being late. And I was like, oh, you know, hey, don't worry about it and stuff. And he tells me, he says, oh, he lost his, his phone. Now, the phone for these guys in this part of the world is, you know, it's kind of everything for them nowadays. You know, it's how they communicate and get around. And so I said, well, do, let's go look for your phone. He says, well, actually, my phone got stolen. And I was like, oh, geez. And they start to ask about, like, let's go to the police or something. I notice he has this big patch on his shoulder here. And I go, say, like, what happened to you? He goes, oh, when the guys robbed me, they stabbed me. And I was like, they stabbed you. And like when I say stabbed, I mean, they basically have what's called a panga, which is like a machete. And they slashed him on the side of this thing here. If they had been just a little further up, they would have cut his carotid. He probably would have died. And so he spent the night 
in the emergency ward where they patched him up. He left the emergency ward, walked about three to four miles in 110 degree heat just to meet me so he wouldn't be late just for one day because he didn't want to miss a single day while I was there. And I was like, dude, buddy, you know, you need to go home and rest. So I took him. So I put, got a cab, put him in the cab and sent him on home. But the thing is, is you think, why is this guy, you think about what an amazing guy to put out that much kind of energy just to, you know, cause it was just one extra day. But the reason is Abdullah's trying to do something bigger than himself and he's working and he's trying to do something big that would help his community. He doesn't get a lot of opportunities where he's from in Zanzibar. But the reason he does this is because of things like this. This is what's called a lost shark, Carcharhinus obsolaris. It was named last year in 2019 by some colleagues of mine. It's known from three specimens in Southeast Asia. And these were all museum specimens. And the most recent one was 1934. And here's a shark that's probably gone extinct within your parents or grandparents' lifetime that we didn't even know existed until, until recently. But this thing's now, it was declared, upon being named, it was declared extinct, unlike the other ones I showed you earlier. But now again, this is in Southeast Asia. This doesn't occur in Zanzibar where Abdel is from, but this does. This is a sawfish. I've talked a little about those before. These things have been extirpated from much of the range throughout East Africa. I was fortunate when I was a grad student 30 years ago, I saw a couple of these. But Abdullah, who's you know, in his 20s still, he's never seen one of these things. There's a very good chance he'll never see one of these things. His kids almost certainly never will, let alone his grandkids. But he's out there every day learning what he can and by seeing what's at the fish markets and trying to identify the stuff the best he can because something like this, a wedge fish, which is one of the species that I went to Zanzibar to look for, these are still around. You can find these in the fish markets. But, the reason, but these were recently listed as critically endangered by the IUCN. And the reason Abdel is out there doing this is because he doesn't want these things to disappear like the sawfish or the lost shark. He wants his kids and grandkids to be able to see these things. That's why he's committed to doing this type, you know, going out there, even at the risk of, you know, almost dying really, to, to be out there. And so again, he's, he's, he's got a focus and a purpose in life. And in a thing I realized in talking to Abdullah, now I've mentioned a little bit, you meet different people along, you know, your journey in life. I talked about a few of the people, Greg Kaye, John McCosker, and a few people that were influential. But once in a while, when you're on your journey, you'll meet someone who's a fellow traveler. And for me, that fellow traveler was Leonard Campagno. And he was, because he was dialed in, he knew exactly what I was doing and I knew what he was doing. He, but he was, a little, he was obviously older than me, more seasoned, more senior, and he was further down the road. And so, but he was a huge inspiration to me. Well, now is, you know, the way I looked at it now is, now is my turn. You know, here's young Abdella, and I realized this young man's on the same journey I'm on, but I'm further down the road than he was, but he's on the, we're on the same path. And now this was my chance to be that senior mentor to a young traveler like him, which brings my whole journey full circle now that where I can reach out and help someone in this part of the world who's, who, even though we've never met before, but we keep in touch now. He just he WhatsApped me this morning and um, he might have even logged into this thing, but I don't know what time it is in Zanzibar right now, but but that's the kind of passion and dedication someone like this has. And this is the kind of stuff I, I meet when I go around, talk to people around the world. And as I, as I, as I, as I kind of talked about, talked about throughout this thing is about the road you choose in life and where you go. I was someone I started out, I was from Prunedale, California, but I had, a, I had a direction, a passion, a direction I wanted to go, a focus in life. And I went out to look for lost sharks Actually, I just went out to go look for sharks and travel around the world. I never thought what I would come across would, would be so enriching in my life. I mean, I've, I'm personally, I've had an opportunity to have dinner with the Emperor of Japan at the Royal Palace. I was in South Africa. I was down at the Grand Parade when Nelson Mandela got out of prison. Now, maybe many of you have probably seen it as a history lesson. I was actually there. And there's a lot of these similar stories I can talk about of people I've met along the journey. But the point is, is my journey, when I look at it, I don't measure in the number of sharks that I've found, but in the people I've met, the places I've gone, the inspiration I've found from a lot of these people, and in some way, I've hoped that I've been able to help inspire them. So if you set off in, in your journey today, think about the road you want to take. Because if you take that road less traveled, you're going to find things in life that you never thought 
possible and you'll find a much more enriching life in the way you, in, in the road you take. So I want to close by saying thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed the talk and um, good luck on whatever lost sharks you have to pursue in your life and happy trails. Thank you. And if you want to follow me on, on, uh, on uh, social media, there's my, my handles here. And um, yeah, and I'm also doing a bit of a fundraiser right now too. But anyway, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Wow, thank you so much, Dave. That was amazing um, and full of amazing life lessons and, and anecdotes. If anyone has any questions, please jump in on the Q&A and leave them. And now's your opportunity to ask Dave all of the questions that you might have. Um, and starting with, um, I, I'm not sure what your name is, Water Witch, but um, or she is asking, what's your favorite shark that you have discovered? Oh, you're muted. Keeps, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, I have to say that um, that uh, pygmy false cat shark I got in Sri Lanka a couple of years ago, just because it was so unexpected, like, because only there for a couple of days and to show these guys a picture, you know, 30 years ago, I'd have to draw on some kind of really lousy diagram. But the fact that you show them a picture and they went out and they got one and they're like, oh yeah, we catch these all the time. That has to be one of my best gets in recent memory. And, and is that your favorite shark or do you have another favorite shark? Um, probably, I don't know. My, my, my favorite shark is the next one I get. <laughs> it keeps me going because it's like Christmas. What, what, what am I going to get next? So. Do you have any plans to go anywhere after, I mean, obviously after everything that goes down? Yeah, I was, I was supposed to be out in the field now, actually. But uh, as soon as things lift, I'm, I plan to be back out in the field. And as I say, I'm just I'm hoping to go back to East Africa. I've got some trips possibly to Madagascar and to Kenya. And I'm hoping if it works out and I can get some more funding, I'm going to go back to go back to Zanzibar again and uh, meet up with Abdullah. And a lot of times when I get a chance to go back a second time, it's kind of cool because then I actually know the layout now. And I, it's, a little, it's a little less of a mystery, but then I can ex build on that. So. Yeah. Awesome. And Missy asks, um, how many sharks have you actually discovered in total? Oh, Do you I probably, have any more? <laughs> so I've got more. I, I, the thing is, it's such a process that it can sometimes take years to name one. And like you say, it's, they don't, there's not really a lot of support for doing this type of research. So it's really, you have to have the passion for it. But I probably, I've probably got another 30 in my lab to do. And that's as boring if I don't find anything else. And um, I'm, I'm really hoping to find more. And, and and this whole discovery thing leads me to another question, which is, what is one research question or or shark or mystery that you'd like to see solved in your lifetime? Ah, uh, mystery. Um, it's a good question. Um, you know, there's different areas that you do research. I'm just, I just like, I think it's probably to go to some go to get, just keep going to someplace new and exciting. You know, it's, I don't have any specific mystery because it's all mysterious to me. So anytime I can unlock something new, um, it's cool. So, Are there any of the sharks that you said um, haven't been seen in so long that you'd love to, to be able to find again? Oh, Pondicherry. That's, that's like the, that's, that's one, that's one. There's, there's a few other ones, but the ones I talked about today, that'd be the, that'd be probably the number one species to see if we can find I, I honestly I think it's probably gone but um, that would be one to find uh, well, yeah I, I've heard of it I think of all the sharks you spoke about it's the only one that I've heard of it, it, um, it's in the lost shark world that's probably the most iconic species because everybody's aware of it and they're trying to find it um, but it's yeah that would be a big find if we, if we found that one that would be huge um, awesome. So if anyone has any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And um, Angela says, thank you so much for an absolutely fantastic and informative presentation. Um, yeah, and, and really, we can't thank you, thank you enough. Um, Maya asks, what was your favorite experience in the field or your favorite blooper maybe in the field? What <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of bloopers. Uh. <laughs> um, I would say um, probably some of the probably some of the stuff I did early on 
before I had like a lot of the modern, I mean, it's kind of, for me now, you think I've seen like GoPros, you got camera phones. It's really cool. But <clears throat> when I was doing this years, as I say 30 years ago, that you didn't have any of this stuff going on. And it was just, it was, it was, it was really was an adventure, like just being out there on your own. You see some amazing wildlife, you know, it'd be sitting in a camp and then having an elephant kind of wander up, knock over a, some of your, your gear there. Why? Cause he wants to feed on a tree you happen to be camped under and stuff. Um, or having lions come around your vehicle at night while you're sleeping in the back because you don't want to get eaten by the lions. So a lot of those types of experiences are really kind of, I don't know if I'd call them bloopers since I made it back, but um, they were, um, I'd say one, I should say one of the more amusing things now is because I go and do, I do these TV shows. And like I was joking with uh, Forrest and his crew there is that I did this stuff years ago and there was no camera, nobody following me around, but I do these shows now and it's funny. I have, I'm doing what I've done for almost 40 years, but now it's funny having a camera crew follow behind me. And um, so that's, that was kind of, uh, that's, that's always kind of, I found amusing. So. Um, we often get a question about what the smallest shark species out there is. And our response is always the ninja, the, the, um, the lantern shark. The, but, but I imagine you might have a better answer than that. There, well, there's a couple, there are a couple of lantern sharks that are only known from a few specimens that they're literally about, they, they could fit in the palm of your hand. That, that spined pygmy shark that I showed you, um, that's, that, that kind of is one of the smallest sharks in the world. There's, there's probably a half a dozen or eight or so that could qualify. They're all, they're small. People don't realize. In fact, one of the ones uh, that's one of the smallest sharks in the world, um, it's, a, it's called a big-eyed uh, spined pygmy shark and it was known from one specimen collected in 1959 <clears throat> and the first time I went to Taiwan in 1988 I was going through all the fish markets and everything and I went over and I, I tend to go look at the fish scrap piles of stuff the discard stuff and in one day I found 36 of these sharks and it was only known from one specimen for almost you know for what 30 years it was known from one specimen I found 36 one day and so that was a pretty, that really inspired me like in, in, in searching for these things that again, it was a known species, but it was one, nobody knew anything about it. So it was really cool to find, find a, a lot of them. That's, that's, that was pretty exciting. Yeah, I, I was in the Philippines a few years back um, in a small fishing village. And um, suddenly a few boats came back with lots and lots of gulper sharks and deep sea sharks. And I wish I'd had you with, with me then to be able to identify them because I spent so long trying to identify them but there's so little known about them that um yeah i've named three species of sharks from the philippines now in fact that one i named after my niece um, that was from the philippines and that was another that's another lost shark that was named i based it on some museum specimens that were caught in 1966 and i have seen a couple of photographs that were taken about 10 years ago that might be that species they're at a fish market like you have but other than that, I mean, that'd be something to be really cool to see if I can go find some more of those. Because to my knowledge, we really haven't, have not had any confirmed records since 1966. Wow. So. And, and that leads me to a, another question is you talk a lot about going into fish markets um, mm -hmm. and working with fishermen. How did you adapt to being in an environment where you're a, a scientist, a Western scientist coming into these environments and not speaking the language? You spoke a little bit about having translators. Um, mm -hmm. Was that always the case? Were you sometimes completely stuck? Yeah, you figure it out. Yeah, the first time I went to Taiwan, I went to some of the villages and I just sort of, I got to, you know, before I got to know some of the guys there, I just would go to the villages and they just, they just see me looking around these shark piles there and stuff. And usually there's one or two people I can find that have a little bit, may not be able to speak too well, but I just, I just figure it out. You know, it's just part, you know, especially when I was younger, it was just part of the adventure. Um, you know, people used to joke around, they could drop me into outer Mongolia and give me a week or so. And I'll be like sitting with the village elders um, and stuff. And you just, you just figure it out. You just, you gotta be, you be resourceful. You know, it's again, it's kind of part of the adventure. Uh, and this um, being able to adapt and be resourceful leads me on to my next question, which is what is your advice for um, high schoolers or graduate students uh, or um, recently graduated students um, who are in the day in, in today's world where we're facing a pandemic um, mm -hmm. are maybe stuck on how to 
get to the next step of being able to study sharks because travel is impossible or, or you know, everything is happening online and field work is so difficult. What's your advice for yeah. them? Yeah, well, I, I'm like everyone else. I'm dealing with that right now. I have grad students that should be in the field doing stuff and they can't get out and can't get out and do anything. Um, the best thing I could, you know, I could suggest is just is do as much preparatory work as you can. Again, it's, it's been a long, it's been a long haul, long lockdown, but, you know, do as much prep work as you can. So when you, and that's what I'm doing. I mean, I've been busy working on books. And if you're at a point where you have some, where you have some data that you could write up and publish, you know, you can always work with your advisors and just doing something like that. You know, if you're an undergrad, you probably have less opportunities, but this would be a good time to try to, you know, get online with your library, you know, because you can do that now. I couldn't do that when I was uh, in, in school, but do as much prep work as you can, because this is where, like, if you're, if you're an undergraduate student in college and you're thinking of graduate school, this is where you can prepare. So when you go to meet an advisor, you go, you know, do some research to find programs. You know, when I, I never set out to find any particular individuals. I just wanted to find shark programs that would help me advance along. And then I met some really interesting people along the way. But don't be like me and wander into your professor's office and don't know the name of something you're working on. And think about, try and think about, if, if you, once you, as you learn everything about whatever area you're interested in, you'll start to get more questions and ideas. And that's where you want to build on what's known. You don't want to keep repeating the same thing. And a lot of times students want to, because that's because you don't know that much at the time. You want to repeat what everybody else is doing. That's not going to set you apart in the field. So. Yeah, great advice. Definitely keep learning, keep reading, keep investigating, and then find what those questions are that haven't been answered yet. Mm -hmm. um, and on that note, um, I think we'll close it up. Um, if anyone has any more questions for Dave, you can find him on social media like he showed earlier. Um, or Dave, I don't know if there's any other platforms they can reach you on. Um, yeah, you could just try or you can you can probably you can go through the social media or you can uh, go to the Moss Landing Marine Lab site and it has my email address there. And um, yeah, that's 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 probably the best way to do to do stuff. And I, I put when I'm out in the field and stuff, I usually post um, when I'm traveling, if I have internet at all, I usually post stuff so you can always follow along and see what I'm doing. Amazing. Thank you so much. And for anyone who has any more questions about sharks, uh, feel free to visit our website, sharksforkids.com and find out about the upcoming webinars on sharksforkids.com forward slash webinar. Um, and you'll also find all of our social media on the website. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Dave, for giving this awesome presentation. It was really interesting. Um, and we hope to see you all again soon. Okay. Thanks very much.